This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons. Think about the last book that you read or the one that you're reading now. What have you learned from it? Maybe it was a novel that changed your perspective on the world around you, or perhaps a memoir that taught you something new about yourself. Well, Chicago rapper, actor, and activist Vic Mensa recognizes the power of pages and is using his platform to reinvest in the city's historically disadvantaged communities, including people who are incarcerated. His new initiative, Books Before Bars, looks to provide underserved prison libraries in Illinois with books or tools that he says inmates can use to potentially transform their lives. And Vic Mensa joins us now in studio to talk through his vision for the program. Welcome to Reset, Vic. Hey, thank you for having me. So good to have you here. I've got so many questions. Um, but it, it Fire is, them all. Yeah, it is clear, though, that through this initiative and through your cannabis company, 93 Boys, you're looking to reinvest in your community. Right. right. So first, why prisons? Cannabis has been criminalized and weaponized to incarcerate so many. I didn't feel it would be responsible or right to enter the cannabis space mm -hmm. legally and ignore how many people's lives have been torn apart behind it. And I feel like the prison is ground zero of America. Like, that's the real heart of America. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's when America's founding principles are at their most potent. You know what I'm saying? And so many people catch their first charge off some weed. So even if we say we're expunging records for people that had simple possession mm -hmm. of, of marijuana, um you can't even quantify the amount of people who might have caught that charge and then were in a system of surveillance and recidivism. And, you know, once they got their fangs in you, it's like they're trying to keep you back in. Kind of like a web. Oh, it's a sorts. web for sure. It's sticky. Why respond with books? Books made sense to me because... That's what I've personally been able to send into prisons. And I've seen the radical transformation that people can have when given the right book in that circumstance. I started sending books into the prison when I was 17. And my big homie Ice Face the Goblin, amazing rapper from Chicago, um, he was incarcerated. You know, one of the first people I knew that was like doing a long bid. And I sent him Huey P. Newton, Revolutionary Suicide, because I had just read it recently. Mm -hmm. And Huey talks about how he was mastering his mind and his memories while he was in solitary confinement and essentially liberating his spirit while his body was incarcerated. I sent that to Ice Face, changed the dynamic of our relationship. I believe it changed his experience while locked up. And since then, whenever my friends are locked up, I'm always sending them books and we'll read them together, you know what I'm saying? And be it like Eckhart Tolle or Bell Hooks or Octavia Butler or James Baldwin, mm -hmm. uh, across the spectrum. And um, I love that. I just see like this transformation in people. And that's been one of my primary vehicles of transformation is the things that I learned through literature. And as I was trying to figure out with 93 Boys, how do I do something impactful? for the community that has been most impacted by the war on drugs. And that's yeah. gotta be the incarcerated population. So so talk more about the impact on you, right? Because you you're sharing these books with inmates, but um, what is the book for you that helped change your perspective? Is there is there one that you can think of that in to this, this day you think really transformed your life? In this moment, I read this book last summer called The Game of Life and How to Play It. It's a little metaphysics book by a woman named Florence Scovelshin, written in like the 1920s. And when I tell you this little book has done so much to lead me towards radical transformation and changing the ways that I think and the, the words I allow myself to say, the actions I allow myself to take part in. Um, and I gave it to one of my guys at the same time mm -hmm. who was facing a life sentence in Massachusetts. And it really did the same for him. And it kind of sent 
us on this snowball effect where it's like I probably sent him 30, 40 books while he was locked up. And I'm reading them while I'm giving them to him. And I'm in a whole different space, you know, as a combination of many things. But that little book was really, really a catalyst. Like I'm like sober a year and a half, like really since I've read that book, you know, oh, wow. um, I changed a lot of things for me. The first book, though, that changed everything for me would be Malcolm X's autobiography when I was 16. What was it about it? The transformation, you know, it was to to go from his transformation. Yeah, his transformation yeah. to go from this um, kind of designed toxic lifestyle, you know, of drugs and streets and um, robbery and things that all like I have experienced and I've gone through, you know, through my life. And to watch him go from that and find out how to harness his his power and go on to be the, you know, shining light that he did. And then to come to the end of the book, go to Mecca, recognize the truth of Islam is beyond black as a race, you know, it's it's human beings. And to um, kind of disavow some of his previous ideas that I can't collaborate with white people, like to see him continue to transform throughout the course of his life, that was really, really uh, impactful to me. Who gave you that book? Do you remember? I do remember. It was my big sister, Aja Monet. She's a brilliant poet and playwright and just, you know, creative musician now. Everything. So shout out to Aja Monet. Check her out. She got an album coming out. She actually just launched a, a play called Viz for Voices with the creators of the Vagina Monologues that launched in Ghana like yesterday or tomorrow, wow. you know? Awesome. Um, yeah, she gave me that book, man. And that book was the first one that contextualized my experience as a black man in America and made it make sense to me. Help us understand, um, what do the prison libraries look like right now? Are, are they well stocked? And what kind of books do they hold? A lot of prisons do not have libraries. Okay. In general, it's very difficult to even send the books into prisons. There are so many hoops to jump through. We've been rejected at almost every turn. Well, tell We've us been about able that. To, what, what, are I mean, they, what are they turning back? Sometimes they disallow titles. I mean, you'd be surprised to go just Google banned book list prisons. Right. It's like anything that is revolutionary is definitely on the chopping block you know you might get it through but malcolm x is definitely banned in a lot of places there's a book on quantum physics that i haven't been able to get into any prison i send it really? constantly to my guys and it always gets turned back sometimes or we'll send 10 books and they'll say we got a two book limit to send to one person um you can't send hard covers there are so there's so quantum many. physics though that one is confusing to me. That one I'm taking as like a larger sign that that book is really powerful because that, that's confusing. It's Joe Dispenza. I don't know why they won't let it in. And, um, the, and the no hard covers hard, rule, is that a safety? Hard covers makes, you know what I mean? It makes some sense to me. But overall, it's not about safety. It's about control. You know what I'm saying? It's like the prisons have been on 23-hour lockdowns it's ridiculously inhumane conditions that people are enduring. They're saying, oh, because we're understaffed because uh, of COVID or something. They have so many excuses to why they don't give people their commissary, to why they don't allow people their phone calls, why they're letting guys only take a shower twice a week. You're only coming out of the cell, you know, at once every few days. Um, I, I think a lot of people don't really grasp that, slavery fully exists mm -hmm. and it's for the men and women that are in prison. Like I had a conversation with one of my big homies who's been in locked up since the nineties. And this is one of the most boundlessly intelligent, well-read human beings I've ever met. And he was talking about how he's working his job. And so he got taken off his deck cause he's, I don't know what exactly the job is in the prison. Okay. And I kind of like made the foolish mistake of one time mentioning being like, man, you know, like how do you feel about not being paid that you're working, you know, cause you're being paid like 
five cents an hour, mm-hmm. you know? And um, what do you say? I mean, he knows he's enslaved, you know what I mean? Like to be paid five cents an hour, but it's like, he wants to get out of the cell. He wants to move around, but it's like, I would never say that to somebody again, because like, we both understand like this is slavery. And you in know the moment I mean? you kind of, it's like you're reminding him. Yeah, I'm reminding of just, him of what he already knows. It's like this is slavery. It's not yeah. it's not a low wage. You know what I mean? Like five, ten cents an hour, that's not like a low wage. In America, that's slavery. You're just putting a you know, a couple cents on it. But it's like that's that's actual slavery. And it's making our Starbucks caps, you know what I mean? It's making like PPE. They're they're making all types of things with actual slave labor. How does your program work though? Are you Funding these books yourself? Are you getting donations? Is it maybe a bit of both? We've been funding the books thus far through 93 Boys, the company. And we have had a lot of people reach out to give donations of like books they've written. And so looking forward to getting some of those books in there too. What are the inmates saying about this initiative, Books Before Bars? You know, they love it. I mean, I think we're still... Looking forward to getting some letters back from people that we sent books to individually because we got a bunch of addresses and names that we collected off of social media. Okay. But I've been sending these books to my guys personally, and, you know, their their response has just been phenomenal, you know. I mean, I think the the most impactful response you can receive is, seeing a change in a person, you know? Yeah. We'll talk more about that because you, 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 you mentioned, you know, getting the right book in the right hand at the right time. Mm. Right. Is that something that you've witnessed firsthand? Like, is oh, there a yeah, story there? man. So the brother that I sent the game of life and how to play it book to, as he was facing life, you know, this is a guy that's had a hard time. You know, he just was, he was born in federal prison actually. His mother was incarcerated in, in the feds, and he was born in federal prison. Caught his first real case when he was 11, and, you know, has probably spent half of, half of his life in and out behind bars. And just a really hardened street dude, but he's a warrior, though. You know, he's a Haitian dude. He comes from that lineage. And I recall before he was locked up, just the content of his conversations was like, often so dark and it was like everything is going on in the streets and you know people dying and am I going you know what I mean like just tumultuous and after he read this little book and we started reading some of these other books we just changed the way that we spoke about things I saw him really transform in that he wouldn't even he wouldn't even express or say out loud um, some of the morose and dark and, you know, spiteful and, you know, violent things that he would think to say before because he started to understand the power of his words. You know, it's like the scripture says, life and death is in the power of the tongue. The things that we say come into our reality. The yeah. things that we think manifest themselves into the physical. That's that's quantum physics. That's the uh, the basis of it is that observation and energy create matter and you know as we started to understand that I just saw this dude who was always so fixated on what's going on in the hood and all you know I saw him start to be man I only want to speak about freedom I want to speak about faith I want to speak about victory you know I want to speak about discipline it's like a whole new person straight up but just like 2.0 you know like yeah. taking that power because he's a warrior you know what I'm saying and a lot of our young guys are warriors, you know what I'm saying? And they're born into a war zone oftentimes. And they are natural warriors, but the way that our communities are structured, you only really have your own people to wage war against. And you're also waging war against yourself in that case. So once you begin to recognize how to harness that power, then you can transform that warrior spirit into a fighting for a different purpose. Yeah. 
This is Reset. I'm Sasha Ann Simons, and we're talking to Chicago rapper Vic Mensa about his cannabis company launching a new initiative called Books Before Bars, and it's aiming to get more reading material into the hands of people who are incarcerated. So, Vic, as we mentioned, the initiative is from your company, 93 Boys. Now, it's the first black-owned and operated cannabis company in the state. Is that right? Yes, ma'am. Give us the backstory there. Like, what prompted you to start it? I've been selling weed since I was... 12 years old, like before I was even rapping, you know? And um, it's my first hustle. Funded all of my first music programs. Honestly, taught me entrepreneurialism or entrepreneurship. um, Supply and demand, punctuality. um, And as music became a reality for me, I kind of fell back on a lot of things, but when the laws began to change in Illinois, I just was like, hey man, I gotta be involved. I gotta get a seat at the table. And not just me, like we have to get a seat at the table. It's like this industry is um, 99%, you know, white, especially in Illinois. In Illinois, there's there's like no yeah, it's pretty white. minority. It's not even pretty white, it is white. You know what I mean? It's like, there's no minority ownership, a couple minority, dispensaries have opened within the last month, but it's like the entirety of this process in Illinois has been completely dominated by like white men, you know what I'm saying? And those are the same people that criminalized cannabis in the first place because it was associated with black jazz musicians and Mexican migrant workers. Um, You know, so I was like, man, we gotta get in the game. and. We just happened to figure it out, you know. It's like we put together the pieces and we're able to make it into the stores like earlier this year as the first cannabis being, you know, sold by a black owned company in the dispensaries. And Mike Tyson was right behind us. And I think that's about it thus far. There's there's a company I wanna shout out called Cronia. They've been selling some things like rolling trays and like bongs and some other things. But, you know, nobody has had the opportunity to actually sell cannabis yeah. other than, yeah, white men. You know what I'm saying? And so we was like, man, we got to figure this out. Like, I got to get, get a in. piece of this. Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I got to get up in there. We've been hustling, man. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's like we've been hustling since hustling. <laughs> Back to the initiative, I'm, I'm curious how the larger Chicago community has responded to, to Books Before Bars. I mean, just a quick scan of your social media, I'm just seeing positivity. Is that what you've been getting? That's what's up. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I definitely... A lot of people saying, oh man, that's dope. Yeah, I, I like to focus on those things, you know what I mean? And I know it's dope. It's like, you can't, you can't really hate on that. People will find a way, but in its, in its essence, it's like, I think public opinion is beginning to shift as it pertains to mass incarceration and the uh, farce of justice in America. And so I think it's a timely initiative. And, you know, we're just thinking about how do we move forward and take it further, man. Like, something I want to I wanna get into next year is expungement. Because when I first launched 93 Boys, I was thinking, hey, we should expunge all the, you know, the weed records or, you know, work work on that stuff. And they were told they told me it was being done automatically. Um, But as I've just done more research on it, I've come to realize that actually to even get the benefit of the law that cannabis is decriminalized now, um, there are capital barriers. There's an arduous process that you have to go through. You got to like really re-traumatize yourself in a way. You got to go into police stations to do it. You got to submit background checks and the process takes like, can take a year plus. You got to pay money to get fingerprints. How could you charge somebody money to get the benefit of the law? That doesn't sound like lawful to me, you know? And so, so, so where do you think you can help? What we want to do is get a coalition of amplified voices in the cannabis space to put some pressure on the lawmakers to remove all capital barriers 
to expungement for cannabis charges and just make it easy. Like Pennsylvania has a precedent for doing this where for a limited time only, they just had a, a website set up where it was easy to go through the process and free. I don't know why it's a limited time, but I'm lobbying that we make that the entire expungement process. It should be online. We do everything online. Why is it that mm. I have to go into a police station? You know how I feel going into a police station? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like A little tense? A lot of tense. <laughs> going into the police station of my own accord? I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are like, I'll just keep my charges. You know yeah. what I mean? Black people don't have good experiences going into police stations. You know what I mean? You don't know what they're going to do. They might keep me. You know what I'm saying? And so my point being that there shouldn't be yeah. this arduous process and all these hoops to jump through and ladders you got to climb to get the benefit of the law that is supposedly created to serve you. Yeah. Well, I mean, before 93 Boys, um, before Books Before Bars, you started a nonprofit, Save Money, Save Lives. Yeah. It sounds like you're going to continue this work. Everything focusing on ultimately empowering and uplifting these historically marginalized communities, right? Got to do it. Why is that so important to you? Because I was given you game. You don't have to do all of this. I feel like I do, though, you know? I mean, I, I feel a responsibility to use my platform and my businesses and my resources to do good. You know, I, I was at, I was in the mosque yesterday and I was talking to the imam like, like, man, you know, I'm a little stressed. I got all these things I'm doing. A lot of them are for other people. I got my own album. I got, you know, my own music videos and all this stuff that I'm trying to make shake. And at the same time, I got all this stuff that like I'm doing that doesn't pay me nothing. Um, right. And, you know, he was just like, he was like, look, God sees good. Good is rewarded with good. You know, I believe that I've been given the opportunity to do good in the world and help people. Um, and I've also had good done to me. I had mentors in Chicago that didn't have to be telling me I was dope when I was 13 years old rapping mm -hmm. and like running community programs and music programs or you media at the library, DYN on the South side. I had these people that poured into me, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's like my responsibility to pay it forward where I can. And I think honestly, if you in cannabis and you're not doing something to acknowledge the harm done on the back mm -hmm. of cannabis, you bogus to me, you know, mm -hmm. because it's like, you know what you're stepping into. You know that this has been used to destroy us. It's like if you just are purely for self in this space, not to judge nobody, not to judge nobody. But I do think that this is one area where you really should have some outward facing community engagement if you're going to be selling legal cannabis and people are literally still locked up for it right now. Yeah. Well, you mentioned your music because I got to go there. Many of us know you for that, right? So can you tease, is there anything that's coming up? Any projects that you can share with us? Yes, my second full length album is completed. And right now I'm shooting the videos and doing the artworks and that's really, really what I'm focused on at the same time as, you know, all these other things. Um, so knocking that out, that's coming out in the first couple months of this upcoming year. It's mm -hmm. been done for a while. I'm going to be performing some music from it, some of the new music at a festival that I'm organizing in Ghana on January 6th okay. with Chance. Um, brought him to Ghana in January and, you know, we just built this gigantic international festival that's that's wonderful happening in a couple weeks and um yeah that's crazy you know what i mean so i'm excited for that psyched stressed we'll look forward you to know it. inspired all at the same all time the things. you know 
We'll leave it there. Vic Mentz is a Chicago rapper and creator of the Books Before Bars Initiative. Thank you so much for joining us. We Thank appreciate this. Thank you for this. having me. And I want to go out on one of your tracks because, of course, you got Vic Mensa in the studio. you got to hear some of his music, of course. Here's Reverse. Okay, cool.